but in water you can see that like there's partial negative charge in this oxygen because it's more electronegative than hydrogen and there's partial positive charge on hydrogen partial positive charge in hydrogen so what you're seeing here is that this oxygen has a lot of electron density it donates a little bit to this hydrogen because it is deficient in electron density and that's what a hydrogen bond looks like and if you're worried about being able to identify it immediately you need to make sure that you have an HF bond, a HN bond, or an HO bond, and you need to have an O, an F, or an N with a lone pair that can coordinate to the H. So this, this could happen between different kinds of molecules. It could happen between different, um, sorry, the same kind of molecule. This could be like a water molecule hydrogen bonding to another water molecule. Totally fine. The next intermolecular force is dipole-dipole. Um, not as strong as hydrogen bonding, but um, it does help molecules stay together. So how do you know that there's a dipole? Well, you draw the Lewis structure, then you draw from the Lewis structure the geometry for the molecule. You find the overall dipole if in fact there is one, and if there is one, then you can claim that there's dipole-dipole attraction. If the molecule does not have a net dipole, then you can't say that it has dipole-dipole forces. London dispersion forces. So before, with hydrogen bonding, I gave you criteria for how to know it's there. Then I said, okay, here's how you know that dipole-dipole interaction is there. There has to be a net dipole moment. For London dispersion forces, it's always there. It's a valid answer for any question, <laughs> any question that people ask. Like if they ask, uh, helium. Is there London dispersion forces in helium? You would say yes. In water, is there London dispersion forces in water? You would say yes. If there's an unknown molecular atom in question and somebody asks you, is London dispersion forces a intermolecular force for that molecular atom? You would say yes. You always list it. It's always there. All London dispersion forces have to do is, it, with is the idea that you don't really know where the electrons are and sometimes there'll be more of them on one side of an atom or molecule than on the other, and that's a temporary dipole. And that's, that's like an artifact of uh, quantum mechanics. Sometimes they'll be on more on one side than the other. And if that's the case, and if there's another molecule that has the opposite temporary dipole, they'll attract each other. In general, stronger intermolecular forces mean higher melting points and boiling points. They also mean lower vapor pressure. So consider these two molecules. Same mass, same elements, same bonds, although the, the which atom is bonded to which is a little bit different. This is ethanol. This will get you drunk. And this is dimethyl ether, which is probably not good at all to drink. Um, of these two, I know that ethanol has a higher boiling point. It has a higher melting point than dimethyl ether. It has a lower vapor pressure. I know all these things just by looking at it because I can tell that there's going to be hydrogen bonding between one ethanol molecule's lone pair of electrons and the other ethanol molecule's hydrogen that's bonded to this oxygen. This dimethyl ether has no such OH bond so it can't do any hydrogen bonding and it's not as attracted to other dimethyl ether molecules as much as each ethanol molecule is attracted to other ethanol molecules. And based on just Lewis structures alone, you can tell me stuff about the physical properties of these molecules. Um, so if I was to ask you how many of these have London dispersion forces, what would your answer be? All of them, yeah, and you could count, right? One, two, three, four, five, five, done. But so carbon monoxide, C O, it's it's a molecule, right? So it has to have at least one bond. Carbon starts with four electrons, and uh, oxygen starts with uh, six electrons. When I say electrons, I mean valence electrons. So that's ten electrons total. They both want to fill an octet. So how many electrons is that? Two times eight, sixteen. So they want 16 electrons and they have 10 electrons. 
So, you know, if you want 16 valence electrons and you only have 10, that means you have to like somehow magically come up with six through bonding or through sharing electrons and double counting. And that means three bonds, right? Because each bond has two electrons in it. So let's draw three bonds. How many electrons have I drawn? Two, four, six. Okay. So that means I need to account for four additional electrons that I have. So I'm going to put two on oxygen. And I can't put any more on oxygen. I can't put more than eight electrons in the valence shell of oxygen or carbon or nitrogen or any of those second elements. Um, hydrogen can only have two electrons in its valence shell. The second row elements can only have eight. And you can have more than eight if you go down to the third row. So this is not something I couldn't just put down that. That would be wrong. I would get mad if you did that. Don't do that. So if I run out of electrons I can put on oxygen, where do the other two electrons have to go? I have to go on carbon. So let's think about this a little bit more. So is the octet on carbon satisfied? I count two, four, six, eight electrons around carbon, so it's octet satisfied. How about oxygen? I count two, four, six, eight electrons around oxygen, so its octet is also satisfied. So this looks like a reasonable Lewis structure for this molecule. I think I've done this well. And let's think about dipole moment. Which element is more electronegative, oxygen or carbon? Right. If I look at the periodic table, you'll find that oxygen is to the right. So it's going to have a higher electronegativity. So it's going to hog the electrons more that are in these bonds away from carbon. These electrons are going to spend more time around the oxygen than they do around the carbon. So that means there's going to be a partial positive, sorry, partial negative on oxygen and a partial positive on carbon. So I point towards where the electrons tend to spend more time. That's the dipole moment. So if I go to this question, they asked me what intermolecular forces are active. I would say, well, I know there's dipole-dipole because there's a net dipole moment. And I know that there's London dispersion forces because everything has London dispersion forces. There's no hydrogen bonding because there's no NH, OH, or FH bond. And that's it. It's not an ion, so there's no ion-ion. This has a dipole moment. This has a dipole moment. Let's do uh, HCl and ammonia. For HCl, if I look at the periodic table, I'd find that Cl is to the, um, the right. So it's more electronegative than hydrogen. So it's going to have a partial negative charge. And hydrogen is going to have a partial positive charge. So there's going to be a net dipole moment like that. If I have um, thanks NH3. So this, this does have dipole-dipole interactions because a molecule of HCl can you know, interact with another molecule of HCl like that. And the partial negative charge here would be closer to the partial positive charge here. The partial um, positive charge here could stack up with this partial negative charge. So it could kind of be like two magnets on top of each other. OK, NH3. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. So one, two, three, four, five. And each hydrogen has one valence electron. So that's an extra one, extra one, extra one. So if I do that as a Lewis structure, it would just be um, H and H. Sorry about that. Let me, let me kill it. H, H. Sorry about the slant. Let me get rid of the slant. <laughs> Wait. I can do this. OK. So that's the Lewis structure for ammonia. 
Uh, you can use the accounting method I did to count electrons before if you want, but you can also use this. Whatever works for you and you can consistently get the right answer, I don't care. Um, actually, I'd like you to do both, but you don't have to. Um, so if you look at this molecule, you'll see that there's actually three things in the valence shell of this nitrogen. There's an H bonded to it, there's another H bonded to it, there's a third H bonded to it, and there's a lone pair. So that's four things in the valence shell of this molecule. So it's going to have a geometry that's tetrahedral, like a parent tetrahedral geometry. But one of the uh, points on the tetrahedron, I'll draw a fake bond there to the, uh, what do you call it, to the uh, lone pair. One of the points in the tetrahedron is that lone pair. So we don't count that when we're talking about the geometry of it. So instead of calling this tetrahedral, I would call this trigonal pyramidal, trigonal meaning three, like the three H's, the points of the pyramid, and pyramidal meaning like a pyramid, like 3D points up. Not trigonal planar, that would mean like flat. But because this has like a non-flat structure, you'll see that it actually has a net dipole. So, what's, oh wow, sorry about that. What's more, uh, what's more electronegative? Um, nitrogen or hydrogen? Right. So, there's going to be a partial negative charge on nitrogen and partial pos positive charges on all these hydrogens. Right? And remember, the dipoles always point to where the electrons are. So, each of these bonds has a dipole that looks like that. And if I look at the overall molecule, the dipole will be pointing up. So that's what the, the dipole moment would look like net for the entire molecule. So this molecule has an overall dipole moment. And because it does, that means that there's going to be a dipole-dipole interaction between molecules that are oriented like this, like H down and up, and molecules that are H up and down. So they could interact and have positives near negatives and negatives near positives. And that would make them attract each other. So bottom line here, I use the Lewis structure to figure out the geometry. I use the geometry to figure out the dipole. And then if there is a dipole, I know there's a dipole-dipole interaction. If there's also going to be this other section where I show you a uh, Lewis structure where there are things wrong with it, and you need to circle that are wrong with it, and then just explain why that's wrong. Uh, so, for example, when I look at this molecule for H2SO4, um, I see that this oxygen has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 electrons in its valence shell. And since it's in the second row, oxygen is in the second row of the periodic table, it can't have more than 8 electrons in its valence shell. So I would circle that and then I would write oxygen can't have more than 8 electrons in its valence shell. Here is a molecule for BH3, a Lewis structure that doesn't make sense. And B, like boron, can, you know, it can have six electrons in its valence shell and be okay. So if you were to circle the B and say, oh, you know, it's supposed to have a complete octet, that would be not a valid answer because there are boron molecules we draw that don't have a complete octet. Hydrogen can have two electrons. and It can't have more than two. It can have two electrons in its valence shell. Boron can get away with six. So that wouldn't be a valid answer. What would be a valid answer for this one would be, look, this hydrogen has two bonds to it, so that means it has four electrons in its valence shell. That's wrong. Their hydrogen only has one, one s orbital in its valence set, and that can only hold two electrons. The, the number of valence electrons have to equal the amount you started with, too. So this is neutral BH3. You start with three electrons in the valence set of boron and one from each of the hydrogens. That's six total valence electrons that are meant by this formula. And when I count, I see two, four, six, eight. So another valid response would just be like, circle this and just say, hey, you know, there are two extra electron, <laughs> electrons here that are wrong. That's just messed up. That would be a great answer too.